Well, a this actually. First of all, congratulations on the book. Oh, thank you, thank you. You really did a heck of a historical. I mean that that's bigger than the historical analysis of Linda Johnson. The you know your dad's book. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. You're like Doris Kearns. <laughs> Well, this actually came about, you were, uh, I think, at that meeting when my Leadership Atlanta class met over, uh, I think I was the class of 2008, and it was um, uh, Leadership Day. Yeah. And I think you were one of the speakers, my dad was one of the speakers, and, you know, my classmates were coming out to me, you know, you all told the stories that Atlantans yeah, know, yeah. you know, part of the canon, and my classmates were coming up to me, you know, we don't know this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so that's really when I started thinking about it, how you know how to sort of tell the story, and then in the partnership with the Andrew Young School is to really focus on policy decisions and policy yeah. choices. Yeah. <clears throat> so that it really is kind of there are a number of, sort of different case stories, sort of different examples of, of, and also sharing with people what are the ingredients that make Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta. Um, and so we've just started this process. I mean, we have an idea where it's going, but we've talked to what thirty, almost thirty people now. Right. Wow. To and and different some different themes are coming yeah. are are emerging. Um, I mean, but you know, pretty much the some of the same major turning points. But they're you know, I think we're collecting stories so that from a whole, you know, some from a whole different, yeah. a lot of different communities to get some of the really kind of iconic stories that people need Great. to know as they're thinking about how to keep Atlanta being Atlanta, yeah. you know, into the into the future. And, mm -hmm. um, and what we've got from being a million people to being six million, and so many of them are all new. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and I've and done this with many CEOs who've moved here. I've had mm -hmm. to sit down over dinner and try to tell it to them because it's mm -hmm. not written anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's strictly oral. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do is sort of capture that oral history, yeah. put it into, you know, uh, put it into book form, have a, also a documentary, uh, and, to, and then to also have the archives so that students can continue to sort of mine yeah. this material. They may focus, I mean, there's so, we've come up with so many, there's so many rich veins, transportation. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. sure. Uh, George Berry said, well, people need to remember that uh, transportation is to Atlanta what sunshine is to Miami. So, you know, That's given true. what we're getting, getting ready to pass, yeah, well, trying to pass right now, people yeah. need to understand that. Oh, yeah. And they, and they you know, so. Good. So that's okay. the sort of context, and we are um, getting, uh, we're, you know, really appreciate your sitting down to talk with us. Uh, and we've actually sort of started out by uh, asking folks how they came to be in Atlanta. Yeah. And, and then, of course, into your Ivan Allen story. Sure. Yeah. Well, I came to Atlanta because I was a farm boy from rural West Tennessee, a little town called O'Bion, O-B-I-O-N. My dad was a farmer and a rural mail carrier, and he said that was the kind of town where you knew whose check was good and whose husband wasn't. And uh, I was uh, got to be an old, I, I was interested in electricity, and it was a ham radio operator, so I just knew I wanted to be an engineer. And my high school physics, or my high school math teacher, there were 13 kids in my high school class. And my high school math teacher made a deal with me. He said, I'll get you into college, but you got to guarantee me you're going to graduate. And I told him years later that I, he kept his bargain. I darn near didn't keep mine. But I graduated from Georgia Tech in electrical engineering and was got active with student body president. And we that was the time of the Peace Corps, and we heard of a program that Mayor Lindsay was doing of putting college kids into civic organizations and nonprofits and governments at the urban level. And uh, it was being funded by the federal work study program at the time. So we started, I, I approached some of my peers at Morehouse and Spelman and Emory and Georgia State and we all said, well gosh, we ought to be able to do this. And we quickly found when each of us went to the college administration they said that money we have but we're using it to staff the building and grounds and the cafeteria we're not going to let that money go off campus and you know we were rebels we didn't take that as an answer so we went to City Hall George Berry was the chief administrative officer Dan Sweat and we were 
were just rebuffed. They didn't even want to talk to us. So we got mad, and the second time we went, about a month later, we had placards, and we did a demonstration on the steps of City Hall, and we called the news media. I mean, we learned how to demonstrate. And we did that twice in a row, and finally George Berry was sent out to meet with whoever the rabble-rousers were. And there were three or four of us called in, and I met with George Berry and gave our case, and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And, and luckily, Mayor Allen walked by when we were in the conference room. And he came in, and I'll never forget, he had a broken index finger, and he looked at me with that crooked finger, and he said, you're the smart whippersnapper creating all this trouble. Why don't you come in here and help me fix it? And I did. I told George years later, I, if he hadn't brought me in on the streets, I'd be the next Jose Williams. And that's how I went to work for Ivan Allen. We created a college work-study program called the Atlanta Urban Corps, and within a year we had 700 college students from every school in Metro Atlanta and a lot of other places working in uh, nonprofits and city governments, NGOs. Um, we integrated the Fulton County court system. We found a law student who had applied from Howard University, he was an Atlanta native, and we sent him to the Fulton County Court, and they wouldn't take him. And the chief judge, I called him up and said, well, why won't you take this gentleman? And he said, we don't want a black lawyer over here. And I told him, I said, well, if you don't want him, you know, I'll be glad to tell the news media what you just told me. And to make a long story short, he took him. Who and was that? I'll have to look it up. I've got it. But we have we also found that the Atlanta City Library had an, a car, an index card system that was coded by race. But unless you worked in the library, you wouldn't know it. And we, you put college kids in places, and they, they, they find out all kinds of things. Anyway, that was a great success. And that convinced me I didn't want to be an engineer, so I went to Harvard Business School. And I came back to Atlanta. I was recruited by... A young group of guys called the, uh, the Atlanta Crime Commission, Mike Trotter, Emmett Bonner, Clay Long, John Cox, um, oh, this has passed away now, and, and they wanted to create a nonprofit uh, urban research think tank called Research Atlanta. And I was the first executive director. Um, and they had approached Tom Cousins and Mills Lane to, to help fund it for, they didn't tell me this, but they only had six months of money. You know, I thought I was going to work for this big urban think tank. And then I found out that I had to work in the law library of, of um, what was then Alston, Miller, and Gaines because they didn't have any money for an office. But at, the, at about the same time, Bill Calloway and Mills Lane, well, about the same time Maynard Jackson was going through election. And when Maynard got elected, it created a real angst in the business community. And Bill Calloway and Mills Lane decided that they were going to create a biracial group of leaders to get together. And the motivation was there because the white business leaders were scared to death of Maynard. And they didn't know what to do about it. And the black political and business leaders were there because they saw it as an opportunity to really make some real progress. And I was called upon to be the staff of the Atlanta Action Forum. And I was, I served as their staff for the first two years. So I was the guy sitting in the corner writing notes and keeping minutes of all the stuff they were doing. And that was when they, one of the things they tackled in the first year was to end the school bus lawsuit. And I remember that they, Lonnie King was president of the NAACP. Dr. Benjamin Mays was chairman of the school board. And they called Dr. Mays and Lonnie separately 
and each of them said, we'd like to end this lawsuit, really. I mean, it's been going on long enough. It's doing too much damage. And so they held a meeting in the, with Judge Griffin Bell, which was probably bordering on, probably couldn't get away with it today. Right. And Judge Bell, it, it was in the boardroom of the CNS Bank. I, I remember as if it was yesterday. The, the action forum members were there, and they said, Judge Bell, we'd like to end this lawsuit. What's your advice? And I remember that old gravelly voice of his. He said, well, I tell my court members that if they don't want to sue each other, they should go in a room, close the door, and kick their attorneys out and figure out what they want. So that was the assignment. And then they asked me to be the staff person working for, for Lonnie and Dr. Mays to do whatever research they wanted. And we did research on the racial composition of each school and which schools had how many students busing from which area. It was sort of a, I remember it was, we, did a, we did a map with stars on it, different colors and geographic. So you didn't have to read data. You could just look at a map and figure out what was going on. And then the parties had met off and on for about a month. And Lonnie... Dr. Mays kept saying, well, Lonnie, what do y'all want to do? What do you want to end this? And he said, we want a black superintendent. And what does the school board want? He said, the school board wants an end to busing, force busting. And uh, the school board started meeting. Bill Van Lanningham was on the school board. as a, He was a CNS bank officer, and he helped get some of the board members together. There was another attorney who now works for the Department of Justice in Washington. I'll think of his name in a minute. And they began to to get together. And then the school board said, well we don't we don't trust having just a black superintendent. We reporting to the board, we want the board to have the chief financial officer and the chief legal officer report to the board to sort of checkmate the superintendent. They ended up saying that I will let the chief legal counsel report to the board, but the board would have overview. It was a balance of checkmating the superintendent. And Dr. Creom was the first superintendent picked under that new arrangement, and the busing case ended. And then the national NAACP sued the local chapter, claiming that they had no legal authority to make that settlement because the case belonged to the national chapter. And they sued Lonnie trying to revoke his charter, and he prevailed, and the case was settled. Um, that was a big issue. We worked a lot on public housing, on racial composition of public housing. We worked a lot on city-county finance. I mean, I've got books in there that are bound of reports that we would write on different subjects. Um, and then when I left Research Atlanta, I went to work for John Portman. And one of the first things he did is he made me continue my work on the action form. So I was basically working on and off for the action form for a period of 10 years. And I got reams of files of all the stuff they did and the comings and goings. But M Maynard... Maynard provided the controversy which would galvanize these people to get together and say, okay, we got to work on this. We got to get ahead of Maynard. We can't let him go do something. And then Jesse and Herman were the two that were told, you got to go talk to Maynard about this, which was almost funny. <laughs> um, and I developed a pretty good relationship with Maynard out of it because I wouldn't argue with him about politics. I'd give him the facts and let him argue with them. Talk some about Jesse Hill because we we have not he's not able to be interviewed yeah. unfortunately but you know the we've gotten a few good Jesse Hill stories. But well, here's the here's the best operate? Jesse Hill story I know. <laughs> <laughs> he constantly stomping his feet and put you felt like it was a guy in in the blocks on the track 
and he just had to jump out of that chair. I never saw so much nervous energy in a man in my life. But, you know, that was that's my Jesse Hill <laughs> favorite. But Jesse was a Jesse was a well, as you wrote in your dad's book, Jesse was one of the people who worked so hard on voter registration out of his own pocketbook. And he backed so many efforts, particularly he and Ivan Allen were very close friends, and he worked after the Civil Rights Voting Act to register African Americans and to be active behind the scenes. He was not out in front but everybody knew that Jesse was the guy who was making things happen. And Jesse was also very good friends with Lyndon Bain Johnson. Um, you know, he helped, of course, helped John Lewis get, get established from being just a civil rights leader to holding public office. And Jesse was very instrumental in helping raise money and, and getting the the organization and the political things behind him. And of course, he and your dad were mm -hmm. lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. But he was also one who was very uh, adept at knowing that the Action Forum, it was the ultimate sort of extension of Jesse's role of doing things behind the scene instead of Jesse and Herman doing it by themselves. Now they had a team of 20 people in the room who did it together. And Jesse was always one who was impatient with the agenda. He would push to get something done. And it would uh, frequently upset folks around the table because they didn't want to do something. I mean, there were some folks there whose job it was to drag their feet and slow things down. Um, it was almost as if, in a way, I've thought years afterwards, that Maynard was the was the antagonist and Jesse and Herman were the protagonist and they were codependent but they really while they disagree when fought with each other they just they they achieve things in different ways and Mills Lane was the guy who was Mills Lane and Larry Gellerstedt big Larry as we call him who's passed away now. They were the blunt-spoken white business leaders in the room who didn't mind putting anything on the table. And they'd state it in the most blunt fashion possible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jesse and Herman knew how to deal with that. Um, you know, there were issues. Maynard wanted to stop... Maynard wanted to force the banks in Atlanta into... Uh, minority majority hiring practices uh, and he cut the city bonds off from the SunTrust company which was unheard of and then because SunTrust would not respond there was a meeting of the action forum held at SunTrust and they invited Maynard, Maynard wouldn't go because Maynard said I'm going to step foot in that place and that was Billy Stern or Mr. Stern who was chairman of the board at the time was um, angry, embarrassed, humiliated, everything about that. That had never been done before. Uh, so Maynard, Maynard broke a lot of China uh, in doing what he, what he, but on the other hand, he would, he would compromise in the end, but he would always play as if he wasn't. Um, you know, I've heard your dad talk a lot about how he and Dr. King played good cop, bad cop. Mm -hmm. In a way, Maynard was bad cop, and Jesse and Herman were good cop. And that played out over many, many different issues. There was a fight uh, between the city and the county at the time. Uh, Milton Ferris was a Milton Ferris was the city council. Well, it was the old board of aldermen, the head of the board of aldermen, and he ran against Maynard for mayor the first term, and Maynard beat him. And Milton Ferris was so angered, he was a, he worked for Gulf Oil for the state of Georgia. I don't think they're even around anymore. I don't know who they are now. 
and he got mad and he went over and ran for county commission chairman in Fulton County with Shag Cates and Charlie Brown and Milton Ferris and Shag and Charlie began to be the three antagonists that tried to do everything they could to make Maynard's life miserable through the city jail, through the court system, through anything that the city and the county had to do together. And we did a lot of studies on city county services and city county taxes trying to put facts on the table that that would is I think it was Portman or somebody said everybody's entitled to their own opinion but they're not entitled to their own facts and um, so they, they a lot of those things played out Portman was a very key leader in that because Portman had the credibility that he opened the first restaurant in Atlanta that was integrated when it was open the top of the mark I'm sure he told you that story um, and then, of course, when Andy was elected, the business community didn't support him. They supported Sidney Marcus. But on the day after the election, you know, Charlie Loudermilk had been with him all the time, as you know. But Charlie and Portman held a fundraiser on the top of the mart, and they said, we're here to retire your debt. And I remember Andy said, I couldn't get elected with you, but I can't govern without you. I remember sitting in that meeting. I didn't realize that was in the top of the mark. Yeah. Um, so it was Maynard went through two terms, and then Andy, and I remember a group of us tried to get Andy to run for another term, and he didn't want to do it. Um, he said he had to write some books. <laughs> he wanted to teach people. And then... Maynard came back and then Bill Campbell. And Maynard, uh, Maynard just loved breaking China. I mean, he was, he knew how to get under people's skin, so, and he'd love to do it sometimes, I thought, just to, it was sort of a, you know, he, he was the opposite of your dad, who figured out how to do things, but he didn't get under their skin. Mayor would get under your skin, and, and sometimes it would take somebody else to come back later and get folks to compromise. And that, as I said, that was Jesse and Herman and Bill. And John Cox did a lot of that work, too, when John was at Butler Street Y. Yeah. John was a principal actor in that time. And then when the Y couldn't afford, they almost went out of business, and John got hired by Delta Airlines as a community relations guy. Was that to help facilitate him continuing to work on mm -hmm. the on biracial issues? Or... Tom Beebe, mm -hmm. who was the CEO of Delta at the, at the time, saw the benefit that that was having, mm -hmm. and they they didn't tell him what to do. Well, you couldn't tell John Cox <laughs> what to do anyway. Um, so John was a, a very uh, John and Herman and Jesse were my mentors. Because when I started getting into the action forum, they told me that I needed to understand how things really worked in Atlanta. And they would take me to the Y and we'd have lunch. And uh, the stories that they told me about how things got to where they were mm -hmm. were just so rich in history. Yeah. Wish anything I'd had a tape recording to hear some of those things that they said to me back then. Mm -hmm because they talked about the movement and things they'd done and where Atlanta was and how things had changed, mm -hmm. but yet how things needed to change even more. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the action form uh, was, a, the action form really served as a role to let the steam off in the business community and come up with um, solutions to biracial problems before they got out of hand. And at that time at least the AJC was not the investigative paper it is today so they could do things and they could do them in secret mm -hmm. and nobody really, people knew about it but they didn't write about it. Um, I don't think you could do that today. I think the news not allow it. 
but then when Maynard's, when when Bill Campbell went out of office, though, well, by then the the action form started to atrophy. Oops, sorry about that. Um, Bill Campbell continued to be sort of a protagonist, particularly after um, after Freaknik. Campbell, for the first year of his term, uh, was pretty good friends with the business community. And I thought that Bill was doing a lot of things right, And but I think where Bill went off track is Freaknik. He first came out and really fought Freaknik. And it got him in trouble with some of his constituents who didn't think he should fight it so badly. Uh, and then he got crosswise with Zell Miller. Um, because they, the state thought that there were going to be riots, and they had 500 state patro patrolmen over there in an assembly hall ready to let them loose in downtown during the first Freaknik. Thank God they never did. But then by the time the second Freaknik came along, Campbell decided to not fight it. And that got him in a big controversy with the media and Cynthia Tucker, mm. and she decided to take him on. And things just sort of went downhill from there. Talk to him about the Olympics and how the, how, Ooh. where were you at that at that? I was point? with Portman. When, so when the, 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 eight, the organizing committee kind of got started, what, what, would, what, what did you all think about that? Well, there, was, there were six people that really pulled to get the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were the early ones. And then I think uh, Billy, Billy and Andy got together, and they decided that what they needed to do was work externally to get the votes and then Ginger Watkins and other folks that that Billy had, and then he hired A.D. Frazier as his chief operating officer. A.D. would just, I mean, he, he'd love to break China more than any person on earth. And he'd talk, cuss like a sailor at the same time, and he'd dealt things with an iron fist. But the fight came with Camp, well, the fight came with Maynard first um, over the location of the Olympic Stadium because Billy and ACOG wanted to put the Olympic Stadium where Atlantic Station is. Hmm. And Maynard said, if you don't put the Olympic Stadium south of I-20, I will have the streets packed and we will, we will stop your efforts completely. And um, that didn't go over very well. And there were a lot of behind the scenes fights between Billy and Maynard about that, uh, which created hard feelings that they never did get over. And then, of course, when the games came, Campbell was mayor. And Campbell, one of the things that he got in a fight with is that he would not agree to the, the IOC had a regulation about vendor, street vendors and retailers that Licensed merchandise for the Olympics was sacred. You couldn't have anything that looked like their product within, they even had legal documents within a mile of any Olympic venue. And Campbell uh, cut uh, leases with street vendors and they sold knockoff Olympic merchandise. And that was the thing that really made Juan Antonio Samaras just, just lose it, is that he couldn't that ACOG had broken their word. And that led to him eventually being so mad that he didn't call Olympics right, Atlanta the there. best games ever. Right. Um, and you think that was primarily over this vendor issue? It started with that. Mm -hmm. Because at that point it became obvious to, at least in Samaraj's eyes, that the local committee did not have the support of the local mayor. Mm -hmm. And that was just anathema to the games because the games they want to have an iron fist on what they do and I'm sure your dad could give you some probably some colorful observations of things that happened in that time. A.D. Frazier didn't help things because A.D. would go in and just blow things up because he had the power to do it and he had the deadline. 
on the other hand, sometimes he'd use that to the good. Cobb County Commission Chair Bill Byrne, uh, Billy and AD were talking about putting some Olympic venues in Cobb County, and Bill Byrne uh, either had some ordinance or some paper passed in the commission against gay rights. Um, and Billy told them that if they didn't rescind that, they would not put anything in Cobb County because they could, the LLC wasn't going to tolerate that. And Bill Byrne had a big blow up about it, so they just canceled everything that was planned for Cobb County. That's how the equestrian event got put in Clayton County and beach volleyball mm -hmm. because Clayton County would work with them. I mean, I can talk a lot about the Olympics, but I know that's. What about the park here? Were you involved in any yeah. of the decision making on that? Well, I tell you how that happened is Billy's office was on the top floor of Inforum. When I was at Portman, we built Inforum. That was a Portman project. It was a computer mart. And Billy had a whole floor up there, and his balcony looked out over this industrial warehouse. And Billy was standing up there one day drinking a Coke, looking out, and he said, You know, we need a park. We need some place for the athletes to gather, like a plaza, a piazza, something big. And he dreamed up the idea that he could make a park here. And he and Andy talked Dwayne Ackerman, who was head of Bell South, into the idea. And then Dwayne Ackerman um, talked to Bernie Marcus. And they put, and then the chamber got involved. That's the, I wasn't at the chamber then, but they got involved in raising the money. There's not one penny of government money buying or building that park, which you'd never know, because it, it's today it's sort of treated like it's a state park. Mm -hmm. And um, so they they used all the money. And then the Woodrow Foundation came up with some matching money that helped them buy it. They would have made it bigger, but the state would not use eminent domain to buy any property. They wanted to take it all the way down to the Baptist Tabernacle. And they even wanted to take part of Techwood Homes, which was an anathema at the time. Uh, think of what it would be if they'd done that now. But, uh, you know, Bill Dahlberg, Bernie Marcus, Dwayne Ackerman, Portman and others were raised up, I think it was like, like $15 million. I can't remember exactly what the, what the amount of money. You went from Mr. Portman's company to Central Atlanta Progress? Yeah, the year before the games. Okay. And what they wanted me to do was to get downtown ready for the games. And we had... Uh, so what had to be done for Coda, that? the 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 corporation uh, for Olympic development in Atlanta. Streetscapes, trees, trees, cleaning up, storefronts, just all kinds of stuff. And of course then when Campbell came in and did his street vendors, it just ruined it all. Mm -hmm. What do we do all that for when you mm -hmm. put these street vendors out there? But we also created the ambassador force, which was the, the security. They didn't have arrest powers, but they had the powers of being uh, diplomats and calling the police. Mm -hmm. Campbell fought us on that, too. He did not want those ambassadors mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, had to get a, we had to get the property owners to sign affidavits that they would pay, pay special taxes into this tax district, which is now pretty common. Mm -hmm. Community improvement districts are all over the place now. I think we got 14 in Metro Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They're but, big in Washington D.C. Yeah, yeah. Where did that idea? We copied it from New York mm -hmm. when I was up there working with Portman on Marriott Hotel on mm -hmm. Times Square. Mm -hmm. The Times Square created a business improvement district for security and for cleaning up the Times Square. And uh, I copied the idea, and we got the state legislature to pass a law that would allow property owners to create a business district that commercial properties had to pay the taxes but not residential so there are no apartments or homes that would pay any taxes into those things.
And that was a great success. And how is that, what, I mean, the rationale for that is how, how that augments the police yeah. force, that they have a different mandate. Yeah. Well, at that time, um, Elder Bell was police chief. Mm -hmm. And Eldrin was not an easy guy to deal with. Now, wait a minute. It was, Eldrin was Beverly. the second one. It was, uh, Beverly Harvard. no, that was the, she was during the games. But, uh, oh, what's his name? Later ran for Fulton County Commission. Reggie Eves. Reggie Eves. Reggie Eves was Maynard's police chief. And he was pretty shady. And then they put in Eldrin Bell, who was a little bit better, but not great. And the business community wanted more police downtown, and, and Campbell gave the excuse that they couldn't have them because they had to be prorated according to some formula that nobody could ever really understand. And that's when the business community finally said, and Pete Carell was chairman of CAP at the time, and Pete helped sell the idea that if business paid for these people, then they could help ensure the safety. Car break-ins was a big thing back then. And, uh, you know, purse grabbings. Um, and then we also got into a fight with him about a panhandling. Campbell would never support any kind of anti-panhandling. And then we got into fights about that time with Anita Beatty task force for the homeless right before the Olympics because she wanted to, she really took it as an opportunity to try to disrupt things. And the Olympics brought out the best and the worst of Atlanta real quick. So describe what was, what was done about the streetscape, about where things, what, what was put in place that we still see today? That the trees planted along the streets with the big, great big iron grates around them mm -hmm. that says City of Atlanta or Peachtree Center or wherever they were. Um, the sidewalks that were put in because there were a lot of old broken up sidewalks in downtown. Sidewalks that were, they didn't have enough money. They were going to brick the whole sidewalk. They didn't have enough money so they bricked half the sidewalk and poured concrete on the other half. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of studies around traffic and congestion that was going to happen during the Olympics. A lot of planning, and it actually it scared people so much that everybody left their car home, and it was hardly any traffic at all during the Olympics. <laughs> I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. Then the second week, everybody figured it out. <laughs> they said, "Okay, I can drive now." So, so some of those things like going down to the AU Center. There's mm -hmm. still kind of kiosks yep. and things like that was all mm -hmm. of that part of And of course the, the, the Olympic venues that were being built at that time and the streetscapes around them, whether it was Olympic Stadium or whether it was the, the, uh, the soccer, soccer fields uh, over at um, Marsh Brown or whether it was the cent of the Olympic Village at Georgia Tech. The public art. That was another. Important. Yeah, that was another thing. Some good, some bad. Yeah, yeah. A lot of public art. Went in. Yeah, and ACOG had a special group that dealt with the art stuff. Um, so was that the last major beautification mm -hmm. effort that we've had in the city? That's that's it. Other than now. The Midtown and the Buckhead CIDs came along, mm -hmm. uh, and they began, and then A.J. Robinson took the downtown uh, CID up to another level. We tried to get the property owners in the first CID to approve taxes for police and, and streetscapes, and the, and the property owners wouldn't do streetscapes. They said, that's a city, you know, we're already... We're paying taxes for police. They ought to do police. You're making us pay taxes for that. We're certainly not going to pay taxes for trees mm -hmm. and trash collection. That was another thing. But they liked it to the point that when it came up for renewal, I think after seven or I can't remember seven or eight years, that AJ was able to get them to expand it into streetscapes and and trash and cleaning. And now the ambassadors have those big vacuum. Mm -hmm. 
little trucks that they run on, and then Buckhead copied it with their own CID, and then Midtown CID, and they've done a lot of streetscape work. And then the, Tom Bell w with uh, Shirley tried to get the three CIDs to work together on the streetcar mm -hmm. project. And they had plans for it, but eventually Buckhead and Midtown bowed out. They didn't, they didn't want to raise the money that was needed to help the project get going, so it only ended up being downtown. And then when Kasim came in, they modified, they took the Peachtree corridor out of it and just did the first phases east-west from the Congress Center Aquarium over to the King Center, which is now slowly beginning to get underway. Money, federal money has come in for it. Different scale for a moment. The tradition of business community involvement in the city is perhaps different here than other cities. Oh, yeah. Why is that the case? Well, I think it's the DNA of the business community here. Um, and, and, and one of my observations of reading and hearing oral history and everything is it really started with the Civil War, with the Cotton States Exposition, because the, the business community was very concerned that Atlanta had to be seen as a place reopened for business. Atlanta, even before the Civil War, was seen as a, the only city in the South where there was a tolerance and an openness in Atlanta that was, you couldn't get in Charleston or Savannah or Mobile or the other areas of the South. Because Atlanta was all built around business and business business you had to be more you, all you wanted to do was do business with people you didn't want to get into their their religion and their prejudices and everything else you want to make a buck and after the Civil War the, the, the in fact that we've got some archives somewhere around here about where the Chamber of Commerce got involved with the civic leadership and they put on the Cotton States Exposition they had President McKinley here, they had Booker T. Washington here, they had um, a women's pavilion at Piedmont Park, they had a Negro pavilion at Piedmont Park, things that were just unheard of in those days. It was sort of a world's fair, but what it did is, is it Harper's Bazaar and all of the news media at the time wrote about Atlanta, the, the New South, and then Henry Grady picked that up and sort of really made the coin the New South uh, into a phrase that everybody picked up on the home and the head, you know, the, the center of the New South. Uh, and then in the 20s and in the 20s and 30s, George Power, Preston Arkwright, who started George Power Company, um, and then Ivan Allen Sr. got together and they started taking business groups to New York to bring manufacturing south to Atlanta. And they did that through the chamber and they even created a program at the time called Forward Atlanta, 1932. Hmm? It was in the 20s. I, we've got it, I, it's somewhere here. I thought it was 1930. No, the initial impetus was rather unusual. Excuse me for injecting, mm -hmm. but. Atlanta's leaders were concerned about the development of Miami and investment coming south but skipping Atlanta and going all the way to Miami. So Forward Atlanta became an ad campaign during the 20s to attract investment in the city. Now, city Hall East was built by Sears as their region. Yeah, they were after manufacturing. But they, also, they were trying to change it from an agrarian economy to a manufacturing economy. And they attracted Ford and GM and Pruitt Peabody and some of the manufacturing plants that were here until quite recently, as well as the distribution facility over there. So are you saying you think that what made Atlanta's business community, Atlanta different, is that it didn't have the sort of landed gentry that no. you had in Savannah oh, and yeah. these other places? Oh yeah, big, big time, because it, everybody in Atlanta is from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't really make any difference who you're 
your, your granddaddy was in terms of can you be successful here. Mm -hmm. In cities like Boston and Savannah, that's, you, you can't get into business unless you have a pedigree. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta was never like that. And I think, you know, Ivan Allen Sr. and, and uh, Preston Arkwright kicked all that off and then Hartsfield took advantage of it with, uh, you know, creating the airport with the option the land with his own money held it for a year before he could convince the city council to buy it. And a lot of people in the writings about the airport and everything else and George Berry tell me that they thought Hartsfield was a kook <laughs> because in those days the only thing you did at an airport was watch World War I stunt pilots. People standing on the wing of airplanes and it was a Sunday afternoon carnival atmosphere. If you wanted to go someplace you took a train. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And there were trains that went from Atlanta to Birmingham to Savannah to Charlotte all the way through the 70s. And then they shut them down. If you could offer your insight on where we need to go from here in terms of the business community's involvement in the city, what advice would that be? Well, let me finish up the first one with the, sort of how we got to where we are. Hartsfield galvanized the business community around several opportunities, um, like the airport. That was a huge one. And then Ivan Allen got elected in the 60s, early 60s, on a platform of five things that he wanted to get done. It was a business plan. The interstate highways were just being built. And he had a, a plan to, to do the highways. He wanted to do a transit system. He wanted to fix public housing. Um, and it was another one was about ec economic development. The Civic Center? And, and then the, the Civic Center or the the arts or civic, arts and civic center. Stadium. Was it the stadium? Yeah, that was the stadium. That's when he, oh, that's when they bought the Braves. Um, so he was a businessman who had an, who had he and he told me as I was working for him, he got to know him so well. And even after he left being mayor, I continued to to meet with him, and I mean he was a very strong influence on my life and when he passed away his family asked me to be a pallbearer in his funeral. And I remember your dad preached part of the funeral. But Ivan told me that he had his business plan all laid out and the business community was all with him in the chamber. He'd been president of the Chamber of Commerce the year before he ran for mayor. So the business community was completely unified with him. And then the civil rights movement hit. And he told me, he said, I didn't plan on that. I didn't even know it was coming. But as a responsible leader, I had to take action on my watch. And he did. And he told me that well, after he'd been to Congress and testified, that when he came home, he had friends who wouldn't shake his hand. He and his wife would go to the Piedmont Driving Club and people wouldn't sit with them. That he had threats on his life. And, uh, but then he and Bob Woodruff decided that this really had to get done. And they're the two that finally told the business community that they're going to have a black tie affair for Dr. King for the Nobel Prize, and it was a must attend. We don't care what your excuse is. And they held it at the Biltmore. And he told me that that, that really galvanized the business community. So about every 20 years or so, you can find these things that galvanized the business community, the, the airport, the, the civil rights, the Olympics. Certainly the Olympics was probably the highest point of all. And each one of those we created business coming out of it. The civil rights movement separated Atlanta from Birmingham more than anything. That and the airport. Um, and each time the business community would get involved in trying to exploit that as an opportunity, just like they did the Cotton States Exposition. They saw it as good business. Each one of these crises, in retrospect, those things that we're most proud of today at the time were very, very controversial. 
I mean, Hartsfield lost his final re-election over the airport because people said he was an idiot. And I remember, you know, Mayor Allen getting threats and, you know, and, and Andy and Billy being told they were kooks and the AJC was after him all the time. Spending too much time on the... Yeah. Um, and then, fast forward to today, the thing that I think is today is that we're in the worst recession Atlanta's ever had. And we're 24th out of the top 24 cities in America in terms of job recovery. We've, we've really been hit hard. And um, so the key question now is, what are we going to do to jumpstart the economy? And, I, and my thinking is that it's the regional transportation referendum. Because what that's going to do is, the biggest thing it's going to do is get the region starting to think as a region. Because the old days of the city where you had a table that 20 people could sit around and get something done is gone. That's, that's, that's history. You've got too much political power in the suburbs and too much divisiveness, racial, partisan, bickering. And I think this is the time now, and I credit, you know, Shirley and Sam Olin started that when they made it unacceptable for people to throw rocks at each other. I can remember when Wayne Shackelford was head of Gwinnett County and Bill Campbell was mayor that every day one would be screaming something about the other one in the news media. And, of course, TV stations loved it. It was good copy. And Sam and Shirley sort of stopped that. And Kasim has continued that now with his relationship with Cobb and Gwinnett and then the round table picking these transportation projects with a unanimous vote was was unheard of. That they could take twenty three billion dollars worth of projects and whittle it down to six billion and all twenty one of them would be unanimous in their decision making. So again the business community, what are we doing? We're raising an eight million dollar war chest now to help to hire professional political pollsters and campaigners to pass that referendum. So that, to me, is going to be the next act. And we don't have any choice. We've got to get that done. If we don't do it, you know, we're going to stumble bad. And I can tell you that Denver and Dallas and Houston and Charlotte and Miami and Tampa and all of them are just hoping we stumble because we're, we're weak right now. And I think that could jumpstart us. The other thing I think now is the, it's time now for the universities to really start working together just like the counties and cities have and to keep, forget their turf and to really do some economic development work as a team. Emory and Georgia Tech are already doing that um, to a degree, but I think now we've got to get all of them involved. We've got to get the universities training people for jobs that are here rather than just out of a, a professor's desire to create a course. We got 5,000 vacant jobs in the bioscience industry right now in Atlanta because we haven't trained people to fill them. So we're, we're beating up on the college presidents and academic uh, chancellors, academic provosts about coursework. It reminds me of something Zell Miller used to say. He said, it's easier to change the course of history than it is to change a history course. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the Atlanta Urban Core, and I hadn't thought about them in years and years. They were still around when yeah. I arrived. Yeah. Ken well, that, Millwood. Yeah. Well, that was the thing that I started in okay. Ivan Allen's office. That's wonderful. That was a wonderful organization. It was, a, it was an un unbelievable internship program. I've tried to recreate that several times. There's no federal money. No. If you don't have a way to pay the kids. But I, the other thing that made me love that idea so much is that completely by accident, when I went to went to tech, I didn't have enough money to go to school. My daddy wasn't rich. I wasn't smart enough to get a scholarship. And I needed a job. And somebody said, well, there's, a, there's an office over here that give you a job. It's called the co-op office. I didn't even know what co-op meant, and I was a co-op student at Alcoa Aluminum for five years, and that's the way I paid my way through school. I would go to school in the spring and the fall, and I would work at Alcoa in the summer and the winter. So I'd go back and forth, and I did that for five years. 
and it made me respect the fact that you can learn ten times as much in the workplace as you do in the classroom and then it makes the classroom experience more relevant. We're trying to do a new course, relatively new course, on community citizenship. We require students to do what we call service learning, so it's not as intensive mm -hmm. as an internship. Yeah. We expect them to do that before they graduate. Yeah. But, uh, we're also trying to put this as part of one of the university strategic plan emphasis on a signature undergraduate experience mm -hmm. for students to get them engaged with the city. Well see there used to be a program at Georgia State called the Model Cities Program that started under Sam Massell yeah. and it was it was pretty successful for a while and then it ran out of money or Noah Langdale didn't like it anymore. I came to Georgia State in 1970 and was put to work in August of that year, a planning effort that the Chamber had initiated. Hmm. And my points of contact were Cecil Alexander was the overall chairman oh, yeah. of the thing, and Jesse Hill and uh, Nigren. It's no, not quite. Nigren right. is a pleasant. No, peasant. no he um, was. Steve Nigren was a uh, peasant, peasant, peasant. What was the guy who was... Yeah, I, I know you're talking about Harris. Harris, but I can't think of his name. Those were the three principals, and I was charged to go out and pull together all the planning efforts that were going on at the city, and parks and recreation, and all Hopi Shelton. And oh, yeah. Lots of interesting people. Sure. What's your time like? I know we, I think we were told we had an hour. Well, I can take another 10 or 15 minutes if there's something else okay. I can fill in. I don't know what else there is. Great. Well, the, um, we had talked about the, well, we really didn't do any reflection on Sam Macell I did, and, and, and MARTA, the sort of transportation, because mm -hmm. um, you said that was also one of the things that, I mean, as, I mean, actually, as you, when you look at it, there's sort of a vision that Al, Ivan Allen had yeah. and saw the chamber on that we kind of worked Sure. For 20 years. Yeah. To, well, to another guy a giant dealing on that in the business community was Alan Harden, mm -hmm. who was the founder of Harden Construction Company. I think he was the first chairman of MARTA. Mm -hmm. and, and Sam Massell was, was trying very hard to get support for MARTA. Um, they had a lot of struggles with the state legislature. They really wanted a region-wide referendum, but the state wound up saying it's a county-by-county county deal. And by the way, that was one of the central fights we had over the current referendum that's going to be this July, is we won the fight. It's region-wide, up or down. It's no longer county-by-county. County. Were you able to use MARTA as oh, yeah. an example? Sure. Of the danger of doing But that really hurt us in Cobb and Gwinnett and Cherokee and Fayette and Henry, <laughs> who said, we don't... We don't want to get sucked in, right. but we finally convinced them you can't do you can't fix 285 unless you mm -hmm. you can't have Fulton County approves it and and DeKalb doesn't it goes all everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's different today is that 60 percent of the people that live in Metro Atlanta don't work in the county where they reside. This is a commuter region, but I, you know Ivan had the dream and he could not get the political support at the time. Um, and then Sam Sam came in and, and and this is where I'd also credit a lot with Jesse and Andy and your dad and John Lewis and so many others who came together to create a political platform to support this thing. And I remember Sam myself flying over the downtown connector in a helicopter with a megaphone, screaming at people to vote for Marta. He enjoyed telling that. He, yeah, yeah. And um, and the business community poured a lot of money into that campaign, and you know, and they finally won it. And, and what was the thinking behind why it was so essential to do to do Marta? 
What was the business, the business communities? Well, it was it was the modern city. It was it was they've been to Europe. They've been to big cities in America, Chicago and New York. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you wanted to be a big city, you had to have a transit system. And they they saw it as something that would really make Atlanta again another another piece of the foundation to build a city was a transit system. You had an airport, you have to have a transit system. You got a professional sports team. In other words, there were ingredients that Atlanta was missing and that was one of them. And I think it was, it was a shame the business community in, in, in Cobb and Gwinnett supported the transit system, but the voters would not because a lot of those voters had, were white flight from Atlanta in the 60s. Right. And they wanted no part of Atlanta the late 50s and early 60s. And um, both of those counties tried twice again and, bo and failed both times at voting for an extension of Martin. And it's ironic that both Tim Lee and Cobb County wanted Marta extended all the way to Kennesaw College light rail system. And he had it on his wish list in the round table and the Tea Party went berserk and he and Mayor Matthews from Kennesaw were forced to take it out of the list. Hmm. Which I think a decade from now they're going to really, really regret that they So by people from within Cobb uh -huh. opposed to it. Fighting it. So it goes to the it goes to Cobb Gallery and it stops. Um, and the same thing is true with Gwinnett. The, the local government, the business community there wanted it going all the way out to the Brave Stadium. The Gwinnett Chamber and many other people. Mm -hmm. And the Gwinnett political leadership got bullied into taking it off the list, which they did. Never do something like MARTA today. No, because the days of 90, 10 money's gone. And that was a big motivation at the time. If we do the penny, we'll get the federal money to build the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And it, the leverage was was huge incentive. Business people could see that very quickly. It was it was it was the equivalent of leverage real estate. And creating all creating jobs and yeah, and spin off development. That there was a lot of anticipation that that there would be real estate development around the transit stations, which in the end did not materialize near as much as it could have. Um, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. One of which was that most of the zoning for the whole city of Atlanta was, was so high already that you could, you didn't, the theory that they had at the time is that we're going to allow higher density zoning around a transit station and lower density zoning elsewhere. But the the city council and the, or the board of aldermen got so much pressure from property owners who didn't want their property down zoned, as they called it. Hmm. I don't want to go let you down zone my property to up zone around a transit station because you're lowering my value. Hmm. So it took away an incentive to build development around transit stations. So you got a lot of transit stations that there's just not a lot of development around it. And the other thing, I remember White Fowler was uh, city council president at the time. Peachtree Summit, which is now where the federal, that's the old federal building right there at uh, Ivan Allen Boulevard in Peachtree. Mm -hmm. That White's tried to get that zone to the point where the parking garage would only be a third as big as it is, which would force people to ride transit. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get the votes for it. So they wound up building a huge parking garage right on top of a transit station. Hmm. We were saying about the uh, police. Public safety the building. Public, public safety building. Oh, yeah. The original proposal. <clears throat> There was a, about a seven-story parking deck and a five-story building. Yeah. And we just said no. Well, the same thing occurred at the state capitol where you've got, you know, upwards of 15,000 state employees that work over there, and they subsidize parking. Mm -hmm. But until recently, they wouldn't subsidize transit. <laughs> 
So if you rode Mart or you rode a bus, you pay full fare. You park in the garage, I give you half the money that you pay. So there, it's the whole idea of, of subsidies. So creating the sort of incentives, disincentive package mm -hmm. was was ne never able to get done around. Never got Martin. done. Never got done. Mm. So that its its effectiveness as an economic development tool was diminished, and what it became was a source of transportation for for the transit dependent, mm -hmm. rather than a real stimulus for economic development. Courage, sort of encouraging a change in some of these patterns to also oh, yeah. free up the freeways for people who absolutely had to, mm -hmm. who couldn't use transit. Because yeah. if your office is on top of a transit station. Yeah. Well, when I was with Portman, one of the things we built, we built the uh, North, North Park office development project at Abernathy Road and put it on top of a MARTA station, which hadn't been built yet. Mm. We designed those four office buildings with the idea that the subway stop would be under the building and it would increase the value over the long haul of that building. And it's it's there now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think maybe, I don't know, a decade or 20 years from now those things will materialize when traffic gets so absolutely bad that people will start riding transit. And you see a little of that, the development happening around Lindbergh. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time coming. And of course, Mars started it when they put their own office building there, and then mm -hmm. Bell South built that big facility themselves. Mm -hmm. Bell South made a huge corporate commitment across the whole city. They had something like 30 different offices, and they consolidated them all into three facilities. And those three, and this was under Dwayne Ackerman. Those three facilities were built in the proximity of transit. Mm. Lenox Park, there in Midtown, and mm -hmm. well. Lynch Park, Lindbergh, and then North Avenue. Mm -hmm. They were the first corporation to really make a conscious decision to place office, their office space on transit. We certainly haven't had the development around the transit line that Toronto's enjoyed and that you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, or, or any other major city. But the other thing, too, is if you took a map of uh, the scale, same scale of Atlanta and put it over Manhattan, Manhattan will fit inside 285. How many million people? Yeah. yeah. So the density is, yeah. density has a whole lot to do with it. Getting the hook out here. <laughs> okay. Well, you've been very yeah. kind to yeah, very generous with your time. talk with us. And if well, we tell me how y'all are going to put all this stuff together. Well, we're working, we've got a team of, well, you know, Professor Newman, three graduate students, and uh, we're, we're looking at doing it thematically. You know, so we'll look at, since we're a policy school, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the sort of themes around, and then the critical policy choices, and then the, you know, and then the courageous leadership to make those, to really deliver. Mm -hmm. Because that's the other thing with, you know, the Action Forum and, and some of these coalitions in Atlanta is the ability not just to conceive a plan, but to make deliver it on it. Oh, to yeah. deliver on it. Huge. Plan. And the, yeah. hum, the political capital, the human capital, the yeah. kind of, you know, leadership commitment that, that people, you know, have been made. Mm -hmm. For the good of the, you know, for the good of the greater community, I, yeah. you know. My sister lives in Fayetteville, and, I, and she was telling me how they were responding to the transportation referendum. Yeah, they're I not said, in favor of it. I said, you know, they, yeah, I said, if people can't get from the airport to their meeting, they're not flying Delta, and they will not have a job. Nobody, we don't really want to come to Fayetteville. <laughs> <laughs> I go out there with my they just cousin threw their, graduate. They just threw out one of the best mayors in Metro Atlanta, <laughs> Ken Steele, because he was a regional guy. Yeah. And they said, we don't want anything to do with the region. They don't, they have such a misconception of where their, what their economy depends on. Oh, they yeah. seem to think that they're just creating it all by yeah. themselves. If Delta pulled all their pilots out of there, that place would collapse. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, Same thing's true with Noonan. You know, Noonan thinks that they're not part of Metro Atlanta. Mm. <laughs> 
Paulding County doesn't think they're part of Metro Atlanta, but if you go look at where those people work, every one of them work in Metro Atlanta. Those are basically bedroom communities that have no office parks, mm -hmm. no industria, mm -hmm. and they're they're driving into the city to take advantage of it, yeah. but then they want to cut off anything to do with it. So the next challenge is how we create an action forum for the metro for the region where you try to create a table where people Well, to, here's my theory about yeah. that is you don't you, you can't create it out of governance. What you yeah. create it out of is, is a is an issue at a time. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a regional coalition of over over 90 different organizations working on this transportation referendum. It includes everybody from all the chambers in the 10 county areas. 100 black men, 100 black women, AARP, AAA. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it is it's it's the whole region, and what they're all working on is trying to pass this thing through their own mm -hmm. constituents. And if we pass it, then th those groups then will start to trust each other. And when you start to trust each other, is when you start to do other things. Mm -hmm. Water is another issue that is just waiting out there mm -hmm. to to dry us up. Because even if we win all the lawsuits in the world, Lake Lanier won't sustain us past 2025. Mm. There's not enough water coming down the Chattahoochee. Mm. And you got to let at least a certain amount of it go right. to uh, purify the rest of the stream. Mm. So we've got to build more reservoirs and we've got to connect pipelines. Mm. We've got 62 water systems in Metro Atlanta. Metro Dallas has three. Hmm. Hmm. The, the city of Dallas owns all three reservoirs. They built them 30 years ago. And somehow we have to convince everybody that even though Atlanta looks so lush, we still have to conserve our water. Oh, absolutely. And Shirley, she tried. Yeah, she, she got did, crucified every, for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, my thinking is you don't create a regional government, but what you right. do is you, you galvanize people out of either a crisis mm -hmm. or an opportunity. Mm -hmm. The Olympics was the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transportation is the crisis. Mm -hmm. Water is a crisis. Do you think there are, there, uh, have there been crises that Atlanta missed the opportunity? Oh yeah. Well they should have done something about transportation 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Water, they've kicked the can down the road for 30 years. Mm -hmm. now, both of those were crises. Um, you know, the opportunity is the university system tied into the economy. Mm -hmm. Boston and Chicago and mm -hmm. San Francisco are known as university towns, and we're not. Yeah, and it's the eighth largest. Yeah, but country. they don't talk as a group. They all are yeah. a competition. Yeah. And I look at it like, you guys, you know, it's sort of like telling Fernbank and the zoo and the King Center and all these other, y'all are competition. Guys, you ought to be working together. Right. Oh, no, I'm not going to work with them. You know, people go to their place and not to mine. And I tell those guys, I said, look, the shopping mall and the TV is your competition. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, well thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.